Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to our first webinar of the fall 2019 season on supporting beneficial birds and managing pest birds. I'm your host, Alice Formiga of eOrganic. eOrganic has many articles, videos, and webinars about organic farming and research, and you can find all of them on our website at eOrganic.org and on the eOrganic YouTube channel. So I'd like to welcome today's presenters. Joanne Baumgartner is the Executive Director of Wild Farm Alliance, and she has written many publications on the intersection between biodiversity conservation and agriculture. Before joining the Wild Farm Alliance in 2001, she was an organic farmer for over a decade. For her master's research at San Jose State University, she studied bird predation of insects in apple orchards. Sasha Heath of the Living Earth Collaborative is an ecologist with decades of research experience studying birds in protected, restored, and working lands. She has authored numerous papers on the habitat requirements of birds and their beneficial pest control services. Finally, Sarah Cross of Columbia University contributed to this presentation, but unfortunately she's not going to be able to be with us today because she has to teach a class, but she is a leading scientist in the fields of agroecology, ornithology, and conservation biology. She also has authored numerous publications on the effects of birds on farms and on the effects of farming practices on birds. So Joanne and Sasha are online with us today, and without any further ado, I'm going to hand over the screen control to Sasha. So Sasha, um, you should just be able to click on the screen with your mouse and then scroll down with your arrow keys. Okay, thank you, Alice, for introducing us. I'm just going to give you a quick rundown on what this talk is going to look like. Um, first, I'm going to do a little introduction on birds and farmlands in general for about five minutes. Then we're going to go into some details about bird foraging and life history traits that might specifically be important for farming. Then we're going to talk about um, habitat, both the influences of local and landscape habitat on birds on your farm, both in terms of actual numbers and diversity and also their pest control services. Um, Finally, we're gonna talk about managing and coexisting with birds, which is gonna get into some of the net benefits on birds of your, at your farm. Um, in particular, talking about damages that birds can cause to farmlands and kind of how those counterbalance with the beneficial services birds can provide. And then we're gonna end with Joanne, who's gonna give you a lot of um, detailed information on specifically how to invite some of those beneficial birds to your farm and how to dissuade the, the less friendly ones. And then we'll wrap up with a little conclusion and some questions. So recently a science article came out which um, evaluated 40 years of bird trend data and determined something we've, we've known all along, but now we also have this long-term data set to um, give us even more information that birds are declining across North America. And so this is birds in many different habitat types, including mostly grassland, boreal forest, western forest, and even habitat generalists. So these are birds that you expect to be more um, able to spend more time in a multiple of habitats are also on decline. Now the up note on this um, data is if you look up at the top and see the blue trend, which is wetland birds, and these are mostly waterfowl. And in the early part of the 80s and 70s, there was some, in the 90s, there was some decline in these waterfowl populations, but a huge amount of money and effort went into trying to enact conservation efforts to help out these species. So the silver lining, I guess, on this data is that when the nation and the people in the nation decided to um, try to improve habitat for these waterfowl species, there was a great response by those birds. And we're hoping that we can see something similar with songbirds. So since we're here talking about agriculture, we just need to point out that among the 1500 globally threatened bird species, agricultural expansion and intensification is listed as the number one threat in terms of um, threats and risks to birds. And declaration by several scientists that um, agriculture represents the greatest extinction threat to birds. And this is largely because about 38% of open land across the globe is occupied by croplands now, um, which is now a new biome across the globe that, that rivals that of temperate forests. So what this means, of course, is that a lot of the habitats that birds depend on, like deciduous forests and grasslands and scrublands, we've seen huge decreases in birds in those habitats. But at the same time, we're seeing birds many of those that occupy these other types of landscapes have now moved into croplands. And it's definitely not the same um, community of species in all terms, but at least a, su a subset of those birds have moved into croplands, which now gives farmers and conservationists this great opportunity 
to try to benefit birds in croplands, both for their own biodiversity conservation sake and also for the beneficial services that they can bring to birds. And this sort of action, these this conservation efforts on working landscapes, um, has been brought to our attention from the early days back here with Aldo Leopold, who said conservation will ultimately boil down to rewarding the private landowner who conserves the public interest. And this kid who drew this really lovely watercolor here kind of had, a, had farmers in mind. When asked to um, draw a drawing of farmers and farming landscapes, they decided that farmers were superheroes with these capes. And, and we kind of agree, like the, because of the fact that birds are utilizing natural habitat in and around farmlands, we see farmers as potentially a really a potentially large impact on the conservation of bird species. So one of the reasons for this is, I mean, here's just an example of what we mean by that. In the Central Valley of California, there's 25,000 miles of ditches and canals and those red lines in the map below are, are showing all of those. And so we like to think about this as a great opportunity. If we just grew willows and some bigger woody shrubs along even a portion of these ditches, we'd be improving habitat by an incredible degree in farmland systems just in this one area. And so for the rest of this talk, we're going to be really trying to give you some of the information that we have gathered in this Supporting bird, Beneficial Birds and Managing Pest Birds booklet. And essentially, this is a webinar describing a lot of that information that can be found in this book, which you can find at www.wildfarmalliance.org. And another product that Wild Farms um, the Wild Farm Alliance and myself and Sarah Cross have put together is this Wild Farm Alliance multimedia story, which is a web-based um, pool that both gives you a lot of the information that we're going to talk about today and a lot of the information in the booklet, but also stories from individual farmers on ways that they've tried to create biodiversity um, habitat and habitat for birds specifically and how they've tried to reduce some of the damaging effects of birds on their farms. So it's a really good resource for both farmers and people just interested in the topic. So birds can play different roles on the farm depending on differences in their life history traits. Um, and by life history traits, I mean what and how birds eat, where they forage, where they nest, and how some of these things change depending on season or life cycle stage. All of these factors are going to influence what birds do on farms. So for example, a diversity of a diverse bird commu community of birds represents different diet types and different foraging strategies. And this is important for farmers because it means that different birds on the farm will reduce different types of crop pests. And importantly, that very few bird species themselves are pests. Next, please. So for example, ground foraging birds like this uh, junco are other, and other sp um, birds include sparrows eat seeds in the winter. But they can also eat pupa and cocooning larvae and grubs in the soil of perennial crops. And that reduces the number of caterpillars producing moths and herbivorous insects and beetles in the following spring. Next slide. And bark foraging birds such as woodpeckers and nuthatches consume the caterpillars and cocoons underneath orchard trees and vine bark flakes in crevices. And they also consume some of the damaging insects that hang out in mummy nuts through the winter. And each of these birds, these woodpeckers, um, are all large consumers of these type of pests that growers see on their farms. And this is occurring during the winter at a time when you wouldn't really expect a lot of that to be happening. Next slide. Now, aerial foragers and birds like swallows shown here on the left. And on the right here, we have a yellow rumped warbler. Um, these birds eat flying crop pests, which are at the adult stages of their lives. And are there, these are insects that lay eggs, which eventually become crop damaging larvae the following summer or spring. So birds can be consuming um, crop pests not only while, you know, while the farmers are out on, you know, during the middle of the grinding season, but also during the winter when these insects are in different life stages. Next slide, please. So foliage gleaning birds, such as this orange crown warbler, consume eggs and caterpillars and vegetable leaves and stems. And um, they eat both adult insects and other herbivorous insects that damage crops, like these aphids on the lower right. Next slide. And many of these birds were changed their diatype, foraging location, and foraging behavior seasonally. For example, almost all songbirds feed their young nestlings protein-rich insects during the breeding season. But after breeding, birds like these red-winged blackbirds flock into large congregations and switch to other types of food items like grain during the fall and winter. Next. And these pie charts represent some of the work that Sarah has done. Um, and these represent the number of bird species observed on farms during the breeding season and the types of diets they consume both during the breeding season and the non-breeding season. 
And for example, the horned lark on the right is an insectivore during the breeding season, but an omnivore outside the breeding season. And in general, um, what this data tell you is that the majority of birds on farms in the summer were insectivores and omnivores. And these same species have a much more varied diet, diets in the winter, including more grains, fruits, plants, and small mammals. And these charts are based on the same breeding season counts, but represent the biomass of birds rather than just the number of counts. Um, and they're classified according to their breeding and non-breeding diets. So on the right, we see this Western tanager, which is another species that switches from eating primarily insects during the breeding season to becoming omnivorous during the non-breeding season. And in general, in terms of bird biomass, we see that the majority of bird biomass in both the breeding and non-breeding season is made up of omnivores, but that these same birds switch to eating grains and plants during the non-breeding season. And we'll talk a bit more about birds that consume crops later in the talk. So in sum, this means that a diversity of birds with a diversity of foraging and life history traits can help farmers reduce a diversity of pests and a diversity of crops. And their ability to do this is going to depend on the bird traits, the crop type, the crop, and the crop pest development, and the timing of both the birds and the crop. So it's actually pretty complicated, and this is one of the reasons why there's been an uptick in the number of studies and a number of different crop types in which researchers are trying to tease apart these interactions. And each one of these crop types here represent some of the studies that have been performed that have actually demonstrated that birds can reduce pests in these different crop types from all over the world. So of course this also means that some birds have foraging strategies that can equate with crop damage for farmers and it is our experience working with farmers and reading through the farming literature that there's a perception perhaps that all birds can cause damage when in reality only a few species cause damage and the majority of them can be beneficial and we'll try to um, talk about so again we're going to be talking about where how you can determine that and maybe how you can encourage the beneficial birds but detract from some of the very serious um, crop pests themselves. Go ahead. For example all of the birds here are perceived to be consumers of almonds and um, a highly detailed study way back in the, in the 30s by Emlin demonstrated that the scrub jay and the northern flicker were responsible for less than 1% of the damage. But the overwhelming amount of damage was caused by the crows. And I know crows are definitely considered consumers of lots of crop, um, nut crops. And it turns out that they do do the majority of damage. But these other birds um, damage almonds less than 1%. So science is heading in the direction of measuring both the costs and the benefits of birds to determine these net outcome, outcomes of attracting birds to farms. And we recognize that farms are complex systems and the main point here is that we can only benefit the farmer and the birds if we try to understand and manage for these complexities. So in the next few slides, I'm going to provide some examples of the scientific literature that demonstrates that birds reduce pest insects in various crops. And the mechanism behind these is demonstrated here in this schematic. Um, so here we have a black-throated blue warbler, which is common in the winter in Jamaica, and they consume these berry borer beetles. So they'll have a negative effect on this herbivore. Meanwhile, that herbivore has a negative effect on these um, coffee berries. So then we find that by consuming the coffee berry borer beetle, the Jamaican, the black-throated black blue warbler will have a, a net potential positive gain for the crop itself by reducing its herbivores. So many of the studies I'm just going to cruise through here um, have, have tried to document this sort of interaction between birds, a crop, and the crop pest. So here's an example in apples from the Netherlands. Um, so researchers use both exclosures and also supplemented birds using nest boxes and they found that great tits reduce the damage caused by caterpillars by between 11 to 13 percent and actually yield of apples was increased by four to seven kilograms per tree and again the way that um, most researchers document these sorts of um, damage estimates and and yield estimates are to actually put exclosures around parts of the trees or entire part of the crop and compare both the herbivory and the number of insects and the yield in the exclosed um, crops versus the crops to which birds have access. Here's an example in corn in Quebec and these folks found that birds reduced the cutworm and weevil pest populations, but that it had no effect on crop yield. And so a lot of folks can determine that birds are actually consuming crop pests, but that doesn't always mean that it's a benefit to the farmer in terms of herbivory or ultimately yield. And so trying to figure out ways to make those um, 
top-down strengths of bird predation even stronger, so they do end up trickling down to something that's explicitly beneficial for the grower. Next. Here's an example in Washington state with hops and when birds were excluded it increased the larva survival, the pest larva survival, but invertebrate predators and parasites were more important for the control. So there are other beneficial um, insects on your farm that are also going to be helping out in addition to birds and sometimes they end up being more beneficial than birds and again scientists are trying to figure out when it is that birds versus other types of beneficial organisms are the most beneficial to growers and why. So another example here in broccoli where um, they also used exclosures and birds had the most important effect on reducing foliage damage, but they also teamed up really well with spiders who also had a, a big effect on um, crop damage or reducing crop damage in broccoli. And here's a pigeon pea in India and these guys um, through observations and in insects insect counts, it was found that this jungle babbler consumed the gram pod borer and increased in abundance when the pod borer infestation increased. So a lot of times we've been able to demonstrate that when there's an outbreak of a certain pest type that the birds will actually increase their numbers and respond as well, especially during the non-breeding season, maybe in the fall or early spring. And here's an example in chickpeas in India. And um, by using supplemental perches, these folks demonstrated that chickpea um, and also sunflower and sorghum increased insectivore foraging in the field and kept the pod borer abundance um, below those economic threshold levels. And I think I'm just going to skip through these next few ones because we got um, a start, a late start. So probably don't need to give that many more examples. So if we could just skip this slide. And this one, skip through this, and this one. And then we'll move on to this and we'll discuss, oh, back to habitat. Um, great. So here's a beautiful picture of the Sutter Buttes in the Central Valley of California. And um, I love this picture, but I also would like to see a lot more habitat along that riparian stream and maybe some hedgerows out there on the edges of the crops and perhaps a little bit more trees on the edges of the, of the, of the mountains there. And what we're going to talk about here is how to use habitat to improve habitat for beneficial birds and um, whether having habitat on your farm is actually beneficial in terms of pest reduction and yield and herbivory. So one thing that we are doing a lot in California is to um, enhance habitat on the edges of fields in areas where un un uncultivated parts of the farm. So hedgerows um, are, are being placed throughout. Of course, hedgerows have been a big part of the European landscape for a long time and are some of the only remnant woody habitat. And in California, I think we've been putting these up for maybe Joanne can check in, but um, gosh, three or four decades. And a lot of or originally these hedgerows have been put in to encourage pollinators and beneficial insects and different types of plants are planted so that there's always some kind of nectar or fruit or pollen available for these beneficial insects and these natural enemies at all seasons throughout the year. And not much had been done on whether birds utilize these even though um, when I started doing this work, I was under the assumption that birds would definitely be occupying these habitats. So we're not only interested in whether birds occupy these habitats, but whether having something like a hedgerow on the edge of your orchard or your row crop is going to improve that pest control service or that top down service with the idea that birds are consuming these insects, but potentially, next slide, potentially if we have habitat on the edges, it'll even increase that top down service so that it maybe trickles down to reducing herbivory or improving yields. But another important thing to think about is that birds and organisms like natural enemy insects are really responding to the world to the world at different scales. So birds being much bigger, having much larger territories, some of them being migratory across continents, are going to be responding to a much bigger scale. And so we also want to think about this conservation biological control, not only in terms of what a farmer themselves can can add to their own personal farm, but also how that interacts with the surrounding landscape. And the idea here is that you have these, this habitat mosaic, you know, of lots of different crops and different types of habitats and maybe even some urban areas. And there's regional, regional dynamics in the bird community within that larger habitat mosaic. And so that's going to cause this larger pest suppressive landscape. There's going to be pest control throughout this landscape to varying degrees. And then when you when you go over to the left here and you add um, a piece of habitat on the edge of your farm, 
what you're expecting is that some of those birds that are utilizing that larger habitat mosaic are going to colonize those smaller patches and then there's going to be their, your own internal dynamics of the community that's occupying those packages and sometimes potentially at least if you put these on the edges of farms our hope is that you can target predation for a very specific pest type and so that's why it's really important to know which birds are on your farm what sort of traits they have what kind of food they eat so that you can try to match up um, the type of habitat you're planting to the type of beneficial in, um, birds that you're trying to attract to your farm. So for example, if you have an orchard, you might want to think about um, placing habitat that attracts those species that, um, you know, look, um, that might attack something like a codling moth that, that builds a cocoon underneath a bark flake and that sort of thing. If you're building, a, if you're planting a row crop, you might want to try to um, plant vegetation that attracts things like small warblers or chickadees with nest boxes, that sort of thing. So I'm going to go through a couple examples of um, ways that researchers have um, investigated the effects of habitat both on beneficial birds in the system in general and on pest control in particular. And we'll start off with this one, which is um, by Hinsley and Bellamy. And this is actually a British study in, in a review where they looked at many different hundreds of studies across the English landscape and were looking at the effects of hedgerows specifically. And on the left side, on the top, we don't, um, they found that the, the width of that hedgerow is going to improve the number of breeding species of birds that below that, that the height of the hedgerow is also important for increasing the number of breeding birds. And on the right side, we see that the number of woody species in the hedgerow, so the number of different species of shrubs are going to were found to increase the number of breeding species. And on the bottom, the number of woody species of plants were also um, found to increase the number of breeding pairs of birds. And this is an example from the Andes. Um, and those were uh, investigating live fences in pasture lands of the Colombian Andes and basically found, um, so instead of being called hedgerows, they're called live fences where live plants are actually used to demarcate different properties. And it was also found that the bird species richness or the number of birds in, this, in these pasture lands increased with the improvement of these live fences. And this is some of Sarah's work. She um, looked at both complex edge habitats. So what we mean, sometimes we use the words complex and simple just to mean that simple are the more managed um, farm edges, which are maybe disked or herbicided or controlled for weeds and that sort of thing. And complex edge habitats might be a hedgerow or a um, a tree line or a windbreak or something like that. And so be, she basically just showed here that as that habitat um, that's kind of faded in the background goes from being pretty vertically structured down to much lower just to let's say some weeds or a bare margin um, that we see avian species decrease along that. So again, the more vegetation density, the more different types of vegetation you have on your farm, that'll increase the number of species that you'll probably see. And with those more with more species on your farm, the possibility that they're going to match up with the, the pest type that you want them to control is higher. This is some work that I did along with Sarah, um, and we looked at four different um, farm edge types. We looked at bare margins, tree, simple tree lines, those planted hedgerows that were planted specifically for biodiversity improvements, and riparian areas, so areas where farmers have left riparian along stream sides. So this is remnant native habitat. And each color is a different water year. Um, and we did these surveys year round, and we basically found that um, riparian, is, riparian edges and hedgerows had the highest number of breeding bird species or species in both the winter and the breeding season and that that didn't change too much between the years and that they were also higher than tree lines though there were still quite a few species that utilized tree lines which we were surprised about but kind of unsurprising if you have a clean habitat on the edge or even some weedy species or weedy plant species you might not see too many birds there so take home message here is that hedgerows can be quite good for improving bird species richness on the farm. And when you look at those farm edges in terms of how they interact with the wider landscape, what we showed here is that there is this interesting habitat interaction. So on the left, on the y-axis, you have rarefied species richness, which just basically means the number of species that we saw. And on the, the bottom axis, this is the distance to the nearest natural woodland. And basically the take home message I wanted to provide here was that hedgerow, the effects of hedgerows on farms differs across that amount of landscape um, 
differs in terms of how far away these farms are from other remnant habitat. So for example, when you're very close to a remnant habitat, that left arrow, or when you're very far from a remnant habitat in that right arrow, you're going to have the most species in your hedgerows. So there's kind of this sweet spot of potentially placing hedgerows that are both connected to remnant habitat, but also maybe trying to place hedgerows out in those more isolated areas where there isn't any other remaining habitat for birds to occupy. And that's where you're going to see kind of the most bang for your buck. Then I looked more at specifically because I found woodpeckers to be big consumers of codling moths and walnut orchards. I wanted to figure out sort of what were some more habitat features that um, attracted these species to orchards. And on the top, you just see an increase in woodpecker abundance when orchard trees were older, had bigger DBH, um, DBH or diameter breast height, and when there were deeper fissures. Um, we also found that the more semi-natural cover in the landscape also increased the number of woodpeckers on the orchard. And also at the bottom, the structure of that vegetation, just like what Sarah found, um, the, the more structurally diverse the, the, far, the orchard edges were, the more woodpeckers that we found in the orchards. And then a lot of studies have also taken that next step where they've looked at um, not only are we attracting birds to farms with different types of habitat, but how is this influencing the top-down service of pest control? And one of the first studies of that kind was done by Vet Perfecto in coffee farms. And just to try to tease this part a little bit, um, so they used ex exclosures and the green and the red line on the top are both um, exclosure trees and controlled trees to which birds had access, but those are in more monoculture sort of coffee habitats. And on the bottom, we have also um, in blue, birds had access to these and in purple, um, birds were excluded. And these were in systems that were much more diverse. So like that blue picture on the side where there's um, much more taller canopy, much bigger polyculture, much more shade in the coffee system. And on the y-axis, we just see that the, these are the proportion of larvae that were remaining after the end of the experiment. So essentially, if you had a really diverse system with shade structure and you allowed birds access to them, they reduced the most, the most birds or the most insects. Um, Sasha, this is Joanne. Uh, mm -hmm. You're about halfway through your slides and we have 22 minutes left. Okay. So then maybe, I'll... how about if you talk for another seven minutes and sure. I'll take the last 15? Sounds great. We could probably go on a little longer too, oh, if nobody okay. minds, just from the point of view that, you know, we, we all want to yeah. hear what you have to say unless oh, sure. anybody has any objection. Yeah. Thank you though. Mm -hmm. um, I'll skip through. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so, so this is just another example. You know, in um, almonds, uh, these nun, nun, mummy nuts are remaining in the winter, and this can often harbor um, damaging insects that then carry over in the orchard till the spring. And so, this person found that. Um, Eilers found that if you had um, a greater richness of understory plants in the almond orchard, you also saw more damage of these mummy nuts. And this is a little bit. Um, difficult or this is kind of improperly um, the legend isn't so great here it says uh, vertebrate nut damage but really is what what is meant here is not damage on the consumable nuts but damage on the mummy nuts that were left over in the winter so this is a beneficial service of birds using that orchard <clears throat> And same thing, um, proportion of natural habitat in the wider landscape also improved the removal of these mummy nuts. Next slide. And then this is my work in walnut orchards, which, which also showed something really similar, that the more semi-natural habitat you had in the landscape, the higher predation by birds on in walnut orchards of codling moths you found. And, and the oranges, um, these were codling moth larvae that were caged and had no effect. Um, obviously, birds were not allowed to access these, but the codling, lof, codling moth larvae to which birds had access um, had much higher predation when birds had access and much higher predation when there was more habitat in that surrounding landscape. I'm going to skip on to the next one. Okay, so that's all great, but birds also damage crops. And I think what many people probably want to know is how to manage the beneficial birds, but deter the damaging birds. Next slide. So understanding the net effects of birds in agricultural landscapes and the effects of agricultural landscapes on birds is the next frontier in our research. And since we know that the interactions between farms and birds are more complicated than just these like singular examples that I've demonstrated so far. One example comes from a recent study in California by Sarah Cross, and they calculated insect pest damage and bird damage in sunflowers at fields that had field margin habitat and fields with bare edges along a gradient of that 
landscape um, complexity, such as more semi-natural cover in the landscape. And they showed that insect pest damage, which directly reduced yield, was significantly lower at sites with woody vegetation along the field margins. And insect damage declined as the vegetation along the field margin became more complex. And then at the landscape scale, the amount of damage from insect pests declined with increasing distance to natural habitats, just like I showed for um, the number of species on a farm. Um, uh, but these effects were not due to birds gleaning the insects. The exclosures revealed that no effect of bird foraging happened. And in instead, um, these insect damage were just significantly lower at sites with more complex field margins and at sites for further from natural habitat. And they also found that insect damage was responsible for most of the damage to the sunflower seeds and that birds did not, bird damage did not differ between sites with and without that field margin habitat. So this is important as many growers assume that having trees along field edges leads to bird damage, but this wasn't the case for these sunflowers and often isn't the case because the bird species that are most damaging tend to avoid areas near trees because they're flocking birds like species of blackbirds and starlings. And David Gunthrow Gonthier also found similar um, patterns in strawberries in California, just recently came out. Um, this top plot shows that Gonthier's team found that insects caused much more damage than birds and that significantly fewer berries were damaged by insects when birds were also present, likely because the birds were also consuming the damaging insects. And the lower graph just demonstrates that birds were focusing on pest insects versus the important natural enemy insects um, and invertebrates. So when birds were present, natural enemies were higher in abundance. And when birds were excluded, the opposite was true. And actually their pest insects were higher in abundance. And let's just focus on the lower right. Um, basically the more semi-natural cover in the landscape um, Dem um, was associated with a decrease in strawberry eating birds in homogenized landscapes. So um, that dotted line just represents landscapes that are mostly without a lot of extra semi-natural vegetation in them to begin with at the small scale and then the number of strawberry eating birds decreased in these habitats when there was more natural landscape in the surrounding area. So this all sounds pretty good and if you want to better manage the birds on your land the first thing you should do is spend more time observing the birds. Now most species in North America um, do not cause damage to crops and many are actually likely to provide pest control services so spending some time in the mornings or evenings watching the birds on your land is an, maybe a first step in seeing how you can try to manage them better. And you don't have to be an ornithologist to do this. There are great tools like Merlin which is a free app to help you learn ID birds. And the next step is to do an inventory of habitat. Um, next slide, please. The next step is to do an inventory of habitat on your farm. Now, many farm maps only include information about the fields themselves, but they leave out details about the habitat around the fields. So, um, which is what we're actually looking for when we're talking about um, doing when we first start talking to farmers about doing research. So the land that isn't in production isn't necessarily non-productive land because it can harbor many and support many of the beneficial birds that we're talking about, not to mention just other wildlife. And I know one consideration for growers is that um, fresh produce, um, often a concern is about food safety. Um, here's a study, a recent study by Danny Karp out in the Salinas Valley, which showed that after outbreaks of foodborne pathogens um, in leafy green crops in California, growers removed a lot of natural habitat um, and because they thought it was the source of pathogens. So in this study, he actually found that removing natural habitat increased the prevalence of E. coli in those leafy green crops. Birds can be problems everywhere. Here's a bird in New York City eating strawberries from a fruit stand. <laughs> next slide. So how do we deal with, next slide. So how do we deal with these birds that damage crops like this wine grapes on the side? Next. One thing you could do is work to attract beneficial birds on your land. So these could be bluebirds, swallows, wrens can be attracted by putting up boxes. However, this can backfire if you don't follow directions and don't monitor the boxes once they're installed because starlings, an invasive species, is one of the most damaging species to farm crops can also use these nest boxes. So just make sure if you decide to add nest boxes to your farm that you aren't in, in bringing in birds like starlings that are um, more damaging to your crops. And there are many resources we're going to give you later in the talk um, to demonstrate the actual dimensions for the specific birds that you want to see in your yard or in your farm. There are many commercial bird deterrents on the market. The most common are visual and auditory methods, and these can be effective in some situations, but generally not for extended periods. Then there have been very few independent studies on the efficacy of these different deterrents. 
Um, so exclusion is normally in the form of bird netting is very effective and is generally safe for birds, but it's also expensive. So we recommend trying to conducting a cost benefit analysis to work out if the value of the lost crop is worth investing in this type of netting. Now, birds of prey are the natural enemies of all birds that might cause damage to crops and commercial falconers take advantage of this and it's possible to hire falconers for set periods of time over the growing season. Falconry can be quite expensive and the figures here are just estimates but a new trial in Arizona is using falconry as a potential community resource where multiple growers have hired a team of falconers to have more targeted landscape coverage. A project conducted by Sierra Cross in New Zealand studied the ongoing project um, that had relocated these wild New Zealand falcons from the mountains into the vineyards and the falcons were free flying in the vineyards. They weren't um, falconry birds brought in by a falconer. Next slide. And this was um, her study question was how does the presence of falcons in vineyards alter the populations of pest birds and or the amount of damage to wine grapes. And she found that falcon presence in the vineyard was associated with significantly reduced populations of about three quarters of the bird sp pest species. So um, they reduce song thrush, blackbirds, starlings, and not as much for silver eyes. And all four of these birds were huge damagers of the wine grapes, but having a falcon on the property actually reduced their damage by quite a lot. The important thing for grape growers though is the bottom line. So extrapolating their model, um, they estimated out um, by taking the mean proportion of edge to interior in the vineyards and the mean amount was that, a mean amount that was paid for by grapes in 2009, she found that the effects of falcons were around 69% decrease across the board and that this represented to grape growers about $234 per hectare savings for Sauvignon Blanc and about $326 per hectare savings for Pinot Noir. And these are all some of the peregrines that could be really beneficial for us um, for in New Zealand, including peregrines, merlins, prairie kestrels, cooper's hawks, sharp shin hawks, northern harries, and red-shouldered hawks, all which we have in California and North America. So kestrels are small falcons that hunt birds, but they also eat insects and rodents and reptiles, and they are found throughout much of North America and are cavity nesting. So you can put up a box to attract them in the area. And there was an example in Michigan, cherry orchards, where Shave et al. found that for every $1 that a grower spent on a kestrel nest box, they saved $84 to $357 in sweet cherry yield due to decreased foraging by pest birds. And there are guidelines for onli online for building structures for wildlife. Um, Keep going, yeah. Uh, for kestrels, they rec we recommend the Peregrine Fund or the American Ke Kestrel Partnership websites. And again, you're gonna get copies of these slides, so the information about those will be on them. So next slide. Um, another quick way um, of helping raptors hunt on your land is to install these artificial perches. Next slide. In Australia, Kay found that putting uh, perches up every 100 meters around the edges of soybean fields helped to suppress an outbreak of house mice compared to perches every 200 meters or no perches at all. So even little changes in the numbers of perches or the numbers of boxes that one puts up on their farm can make a really big difference in terms of controlling some of the rodents. In North America, we had great horned owls, um, American kestrels, red-tailed hawks, and golden eagles, which are all using perches in one winter. This is on a study that Sarah did. And Swainson's hawks, turkey vultures, and other birds of prey also use these artificial perches. So to build these, they can either be concreted into the ground or attached to an existing fence post. And they created a new design for rangelands that found that raptors preferred to perch on 15 foot tall perches, um, on perches on top of hills, and on perches that weren't immediately adjacent to trees. And barn owl boxes can double as raptor perches. So there's a nervous barn owl, barn owl with a golden eagle sitting on top. <laughs> and finally, we're gonna talk about barn owls because they are really amazing, natural, um, beneficial, beneficial animal, natural enemy. Next slide. Farmers in many areas of California and also in Malaysia and Israel have invested a lot in constructing these nest boxes to increase barn owl populations. And Sarah conducted a study with her students to examine the diet of barn owls in California farms and found evidence to demonstrate that, um, next slide please, to demonstrate the long held notion that barn owls are really are generalist predators. In her study region, barn owls surrounded mainly by row crops had diets consisting of more mice and those surrounded mainly by vineyards and orchards had diets that were mainly gophers. So barn owls in both habitat types also ate a lot of voles. 
And the annual biomass requirements for a typical pair of breeding owls and their progeny is about 215 pounds of rodent prey or over 2,500 rodents. So the numbers are pretty impressive. One reason for this is that lower pole, um, sorry, boxes can be as low as eight to 12 feet from the ground and they should be checked and cleaned by the end of the December of each year. Um, however, Wendon Johnson found that poles greater than three meters tall, meters tall were more likely to be occupied by bur burrowing owls. So there's some difference in research there. Um, one reason for that is that lower poles are easier for the growers and the scientists to access them without specialized equipment. So it's kind of a trade-off between what the birds like the most and what's the easiest to manage. So there are a lot of actions you can take for birds of prey on your farm that will help keep the balance in, pop um, balance in populations on the farm. Um, raptors are great, but how do I get more of them? You can provide habitat for nesting, keep local populations healthy. Remember that red-tailed hawks like tall trees and sharp-shinned hawks like forested areas. And kestrels and barn owls are cavity limited, so putting up boxes and retaining old or dead trees is really going to help them out. So that was very quick, and now I'm going to um, introduce Joanne, who will finally get to do her section. And thanks for being patient with my technical difficulties. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Okay, so Alice, I think I'm going to be asking you to uh, continue um, advancing sure. the slides. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, yeah, so I'm going to just talk more about how farmers uh, can make their farms more bird friendly and resilient. And, and as you've heard, it's, it's a lot about habitat. It's also about uh, providing water sources. And then there's some management actions farmers can take. Um, so next. With structural habitat, we talked about nest boxes and um, not so much, but platforms and ledges, those are all supporting nesting. And so that's only going to support birds during the nesting season. And nest boxes specifically are only going to support cavity nesters. Um, perches are going to support birds year round. Next. Vegetative habitat. Uh, it's going to support more comprehensive long term uh, bird presence and um, that's because you know it's 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 providing food uh, in the source of uh, insects, especially if it's native habitat and uh, fruit it's also uh, providing cover from predators and cover from the elements um, repairing habitat can be some of the uh, best places to start. Uh, here at High Ground Organic Farm, Stephen Pedersen was telling me the other day, he's, that's where he started and it made most sense that this is where uh, the farm was eroding uh, a bit uh, when he took it over and so it is also wet soil there. So by planting habitat, he has now supported lots of beneficial birds and uh, lots of farms have these uh, drainages or, or wet areas. Um, but um, it, co it could be anywhere that they plant habitat next. Um, because you can, uh, with large uh, fields, you could put interior habitat and or think about breaking up those large fields and making them smaller and having more edge habitat. You can use hedgerows, um, which also have multiple benefits, including supporting uh, beneficial insects and windbreaks, which also um, uh, stop uh, impacts from wind. Um, next slide. So uh, NRCS, uh, you saw one slide about NRCS, the e EQIP program, Environmental Quality Incentive Program, supports lots of practices like these and others you're going to hear um, me talk about. They are offering technical and financial support. The um, thing about habitat, sometimes farmers, if, the, if they don't really understand what is there, they think, oh, 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 that's not crop habitat, so whatever those plants are, are useless. But in fact, especially if they're native and especially if they're trees and or um, trees with cavities and or dead trees, snags with cavities, they're really important. And so before clearing any habitat, make sure you know what you have and then look for those odd shaped places where you can put in uh, vegetative habitat. But as you'll see here, especially down lower on in this list, 
and RCS supports um, lo lots of different kinds of structures. Uh, so it's not just vegetative habitat they'll help you with. Next. Native plants are predominantly more uh, beneficial to birds than non-native plants. This is a list of um, native trees that comes from the mid-Atlantic region of the East Coast where um, Doug Tallamy in his Bringing Nature Home book lists how many caterpillars are supported by these trees. So you can see there's a, over 500 supported by um, oak trees. And while that may not be the case throughout the country that there's 500, it's likely that these and uh, other oaks and other species like these natives are supporting lots more um, caterpillars. And, and birds are eating caterpillars um, uh, themselves as adults, but especially feeding high protein food sources like that to their nestlings. And in fact, um, uh, the, uh, um, in the yards of Washington, D.C., there was an interesting study that showed that chickadees uh, had nest failures when there wasn't at least 70% of native habitat present. Thank you. Next slide. Um, so water sources uh, are important. Birds need to take baths to keep their feathers clean. At Fresh Run Farm, Peter Martinelli has this beautiful um, uh, healthy creek, but also he provides some muddy areas on his farm so that swallows can uh, build their mud nest. Next. Now, even though this is an e-organic webinar, I thought it would be important to talk about pesticides, organic uh, growers use pesticides, but also many organic growers or managers are also managing conventional fields. And neonicotinoid uh, treated seed that you see on the left, the, the blue soybeans and red corn um, can be really problematic. Land birds experience declines when near water with high concentrations of these neonics. And um, another study, white crowned sparrows experimentally dosed with field realistic quantities of neonics experience rapid declines in food consumption, resulting in decreased fat stores and body mass and, and as especially troubling, um, significantly increase their ability to migrate. Rodenticides are also a problem, especially the second generation rodenticides. What happens is they, the uh, rodent will keep eating it before it dies, and so it builds up this huge burden that then if a raptor eats it, um, they're, they're not going to do well and often uh, um, yeah, are killed. And so, um, and then uh, this is a picture of cannabis with rodenticides, um, which, you know, having that uh, tainted food source out, birds are going to eat that too. So, so this is um, altogether not a good idea. Organic farmers use herbicides. So whether you're organic or not, thinking about, um, you know, what is the effect, there's always, you know, cause and effect. And when we keep our farms really clean, clean and there's a, there can be good reasons to keep weed seeds down, that also means that you, if there's less plants covering the soil, there's um, less food sources that uh, support insects and birds and, and provide um, seed for birds. Next slide. A management tool at Phil Foster Ranches is um, uh, doing minimum tillage. He's figuring out which kinds of um, cover crops he can use to, um, uh, to grow in succession with his vegetable crops. And he's using a roller crimper to knock them down. So there's a lot more um, cover in his fields. And that means there's a lot more insects for uh, birds to eat and seed. Next slide. This is on page 19 of our bird booklet. This chart is showing predominantly insectivorous birds and I noticed uh, the first green ar arrow should be coming from um, astroded flycatcher, so that one's just a bit off. I must have changed the slide, but in any case, this is an image of River Hill Farm, uh, astroded flycatcher uh, nest box, and, and our uh, multimedia story 
platform that we told you about earlier um, is going to be highlighting a story about River Hill Farm and how they are supporting uh, insectivorous birds like uh, this flycatcher. Sometimes uh, so just allowing birds like these cliff swallows to uh, build their nest under eaves is all a farmer needs to do. Next slide. Other types of insectivores need that habitat, like these bush tits and or warblers. They're not going to use nest boxes or eaves or platforms. Next slide. Carnivores, sometimes, you know, we heard about uh, barn owl boxes, but there's other carnivores like great blue herons that can, you can provide um, platforms if there aren't already trees for them. And uh, with the multimedia story platform, our video that is up right now is about a farm, um, Dwayne Chamberlain's farm, where he has this really cool um, uh, a, a thing happening where the what he calls uh, the moving lunch rack where um, he flood irrigates and a wave of water comes down through the field forcing pests up and and so there's um, this you know these herons and egrets that are there ready and waiting. Uh, next slide. Um, so this uh, chart shows that uh, the omnivores, which uh, Sasha talked about earlier too, that we um, will need to practice coexistence with some of these birds. They are predominantly feeding their young insects uh, during nesting season, but may have to discourage them later on. Next slide. So I wanted to get at a foraging uh, from a farmer perspective. Where are the crop pests? So they're, they're air flying pest insects and pest birds. There's pest insects in orchard trees. And then there's pest insects lower down in the bushes, the, the grow, low growing plants and on the ground. Next slide. So up above, the aerial uh, insects can be eaten by swallows. You saw the cliff swallow um, nesting under the eaves. These are barn swallows that nest in the barns and or on the left um, at Blue Heron Farm is tr are tree swallows and they'll use the same nest box as uh, bluebirds uh, that, because they uh, need the same entrance size hole. What Dennis T T Tamara says at uh, Blue Heron is once the swallows leave in the uh, summer, fall, he really notices a big difference. There's more pests in his crops. Next slide. Um, I don't see it advancing, but um, there we go. Flycatchers uh, are also eating insects in the air. They are the kind of birds that uh, fly out and come back to a uh, place, could be a roof or uh, or a post or um, habitat. If these birds don't uh, use nest boxes, they need habitat uh, to build their nests next. Also, aerial pests are, are birds and who eats them? Falcons. Uh, Cooper hawks like the one on the left, they don't use nest boxes, they'll use perches uh, and like this, um, like that a bush. I wanted to uh, uh, mentioned, thank you, that the, uh, there was a cool story from Stephen Pedersen, how he heard this raucous calling of crows and he went to lick and see what was going on and a peregrine falcon had caught a crow and was eating it and all the other crows, you know, related crows were there um, having a fit about it and Stephen was actually kind of pleased because the crows had been pulling up transplants and they weren't sure how they were going to stop them and now he has no crow problems. Um, on the right is a kestrel, and we heard about how um, you can put in kestrel boxes next. So we also heard about nettles woodpeckers and how uh, habitat, like at Centrona Farms, they put in, have hedgerows that then um, increase the um, bird uh, numbers and uh, woodpeckers need big trees where they can uh, excavate cavities. They are the cavity excavator that all the other birds then use their cavities later. They will not use um, nest boxes themselves. Next. Chickadees, we heard about them and uh, this is where I did my research looking at um, birds eating calling moth in the 
overwintering phase, they ate 70 to 90% of the collie moth. And um, uh, we also heard about how great tits are, uh, are which is a relative of chickadees in, the, in uh, Europe, help to reduce um, that pest and increase yields uh, by 66%. And they do use nest boxes next. So now we're getting lower down in the bushes, uh, low growing plants, uh, bluebirds, that's where they're hanging out. And uh, Julie Johnson at Trace of Boris Vineyards put up 50 bluebird boxes. Remember tree swallows will also use those so she gets a double benefit. But these birds are low, lower down in the canopy and um, uh, researcher Julie Jadlik have found that uh, while they, um, she found that they'll eat uh, sage leafhoppers, which are related to the blue-green sharpshooter that carries Pierce's disease and is is important uh, uh, pest of uh, vineyards. Um, that's very likely that they will then eat that blue-green. She also found that when you put up nest boxes uh, and put out experimentally uh, placed uh, insects, that the birds eat a lot more of them near those nest boxes. Ne next. Um, hedgerows can support more pest uh, uh, consumption by birds uh, like these jays and robins. Next. And then uh, there's been some studies where putting up rows of sunflowers serve as perches for songbirds and uh, help to reduce pest insects in Florida organic farms. Sometimes farmers also put up not just these fence posts, but um, bamboo uh, tea structures as perches for songbirds. And we've seen uh, reductions in pest insects um, when doing that. Next slide. So we've talked about um, rodents some. I heard that from Sasha and I uh, just want to point out that they don't all, they'll all use perches but they don't all use um, boxes. So again having habitat having big trees for say red tail hawks and some falcons is uh, always a good idea. Next. In the appendix of our bird booklet is um, shows over 100 or almost 120 studies uh, of pest control by birds and about 90 percent of them show benefits. So you can look through the different colors indicate whether this is in vegetables or fruit or nut crops or field crops and so forth and you can look through that and see if the crops that you are growing or managing um, have been studied, but even if they haven't, you'll also get the sense that birds are important for pest control in, in many ways. Um, next slide. Cats can be a problem. They, they estimated they kill billion, billion birds a year in the U.S. Next slide. So putting up um, predator guards is really important. Cornell's Nest Watch is a good place to go to find information about that. You click on learn and about bird houses then plans for predator guards. This uh, website also has some really great information on nest boxes. You can download plans for nest boxes. This, um, as, as Sasha mentioned, it's a really important to uh, figure out who is on your farms, especially as you start to increase habitat. So you can look back and really tell that document that there's a difference and, and feel good about that difference. And, and besides Merlin, which was mentioned, this All About Birds helps farmers ID birds and gives life history and maps and songs. Uh, next. Ebird.org is also another really great tool. Say you wanted to find out if bluebirds even live in your area because you want to put up bluebird boxes, you can go to their species map and put in, uh, uh, type in Western bluebird and then type in what county you're in. Next slide. And for my county, this is where this shows, yes, they're here. And it also can tell you if they're here year round or uh, lots of information. This is all citizen science people who love birds are um, um, 
uh, sorry, uh, our, our, our reporting what they see. Next slide. So in summary, you know, we heard about birds are in decline and we know that climate change is exacerbating the, uh, exacerbating the loss. Um, more habitat in and around the farm is generally going to support more birds and generally help with pest control. And this uh, ecosystem service that birds provide helps us and others alike. And just wanted to mention though that birds are not going to support every single kind of I mean, farms aren't going to support every kind of bird. Some birds need really wild spaces. Next. And uh, we love this, this image of farmers being heroes and how, uh, you know, they have a lot of opportunity to help um, uh, support birds and also benefit from them. Next. So use those structures, plant and restore native habitat, provide water, co-manage as much as possible those, uh, with those uh, birds that can be passed part of the year. Take care when there's cats around or using pesticides and also become involved in d directing policies that help support more research on avian pest control and help support more farm bill programs because a lot of them do help with uh, supporting birds. And then, you know, in general, the bigger picture, a lot of our birds are migrating north or south out of our country. So we need to think globally and support those as well. Next slide. Um, yeah, check this out at uh, our booklet, um, wildfarmalliance.org. Next slide. And uh, this um, uh, link to our new online multimedia story platform. Next slide. This, and this is it. This is our contact information. If you have any questions uh, later after this talk, you can um, contact any one of us and also check out um, all three of our websites. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joanne, and thank you, Sasha, um, and thanks, everyone. Um, we're going to have some time for questions and answers. So I know we have some questions in the queue. Um, someone asked about cats and other free-ranging um, predators, and um, with, um, he was wondering if there's a role for predator control efforts, such as trapping or hunting for nest and bird predators um, or predator exclusion and control has shown some success for waterfowl populations in the Dakotas. So do you have any suggestions about that? Hi. Um, yeah, it's not, no, um, it's not something I would, <laughs> I mean, I'm most interested in, in, you know, providing habitat and letting nature take its course. Um, I would be interested in, you know, the biggest predator of birds and farmlands probably in terms of mammals is, is domestic cats. And we realize that that's a bit of an issue because cats also help out with rodents on the farm, especially around the, the buildings. Um, but they are one of the largest predators of birds, songbirds especially, and, um, their numbers just very much outweigh any kind of predation they would experience from say something like a bobcat. So um, uh, predation is, you know, something that songbirds have to deal with and, um, but often their most predation is done by some, you know, things like snakes and um, rodents and um, other bigger birds that are also just trying to, to feed their kids. So um, I wouldn't really recommend um, using trapping for predators of songbirds if I understand your question correctly. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, do you have any, do the growers that you work with have any concerns or pressure from buyers about increasing contamination on produce from bird scat? For example, the apples and broccoli that are eaten raw. Yes, um, and I guess I just touched on that, but I was really whizzing through it. Um, yeah, there's a lot of concern. And one thing I did mean to mention and just cut in Joanne whenever, um, is that we realize that farmers are often caught in this rock between a rock and hard place. You know, they might really want a lot of habitat on their farms or might really want to be supporting wildlife, but there's large restrictions on the sorts of, um, from, from purchasers in terms of the amount of damage that they can have and, and also just concerns about habitat bringing in things like E. coli, like you mentioned. So for example, um, she, maybe Joanne knows a lot about the Salinas Valley leafy green vegetable scenario that she could chime in on that one. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. Well, and I wanted to mention, um, I heard Danny Karp give a presentation recently on some data he hasn't published yet, but where he's been working in organic strawberries and they uh, took 10,000 samples of strawberries to see how much bird feces were on them and they found like two or three. Now that was directly on the crop, not, you know, in the uh, field. So, um, so, you know, how much is actually hitting the crop is a, a good question. And then there are natural, uh, a lot of natural factors that help keep our farms healthy. For instance, UV radiation kills pathogens on the surface of fruit and leaves and um, uh, sunlight desiccates pathogens. And so bird poop is really small as opposed to if you were to take a big pile of manure and bury it wet in the soil, it could last for a year or more, th those pathogens, as opposed to um, some bird feces. But that's not to say birds can't be a problem. Birds, where most of the research shows that birds are, have a very low risk of carrying pathogens, it could happen on your farm. Usually, if it, 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 birds that have been tracked um, carrying pathogens are ones that are associated with uh, human cause contamination, like we're keeping animals together in huge concentrated feeding lots, for instance, or um, near some other pollution like um, uh, dumps. So, um, yeah, yeah, so go ahead. Agreed. Yeah. And I guess I would just, just um, sort of end that off with discussing, yeah, just thinking about things in terms of the amount of risk. So um, birds certainly pose a risk and because human life is a concern here, obviously that's a really big deal and, and something very, that we should really be concerned about. And that's why the research is heading in that direction. Um, birds fly all over the landscape. Um, the biggest thing we can do, I think, is to keep, is separating out the contamination sources just because, um, being able to control every bird and every small mammal that might enter the farm is a pretty pretty high bar um, when the risk itself is is overall not very high. Okay, um, we have a lot more questions coming in. Um, let's see, um, you were talking about um, perches um, for raptors and um, how that might be an alternative for rodenticides. Um, and also some people don't wanna use snap traps in greenhouse production. So um, they were wondering whether perches for raptors near greenhouses are a viable option. They read about using perches for rodent control in your publication. Um, so how many perches might one put near a greenhouse and how tall and how far from the greenhouse? Do you think that would make any difference in the greenhouse? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, having um, perches around the farm is going to reduce the overall rodent population for chunks of time. Um, in terms of the greenhouse specifically, um, you could, I mean, I'm guessing that the rodents utilize the greenhouse for shelter and might actually run away from any <laughs> rodents that are, or might use it as a protective source away from rodent or pet raptors that are being encouraged onto the farm by perches. So um, I'm trying to think, I haven't really, really thought about um, helping out with greenhouses much. Yeah. yeah, and I don't know, I, if, I guess it would depend, like if you're seeing raptors flying into your greenhouse, mm -hmm. then that um, would mean that they wouldn't be afraid to do that, but it is possible that it would, it would feel dangerous being in some kind of semi-enclosed environment like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think I would ever expect a, a raptor to go inside a greenhouse. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, regarding conversion of waterways to bird habitat, is there a concern about concentration of herbicides, pesticides, et cetera, runoff into these waterways from conventional farmland having a negative effect on birds? And how would one mitigate potential chemical exposure? Would you partner with local farmers to try to reduce and manage chemicals? Or do you have any suggestions for that type of problem? Well, I know that one of the main reasons that um, hedgerows were initially being um, implemented in the 30s here anyway was to help out with soil erosion and also drift from chemicals. So certainly having farms next to waterways is an issue in terms of um, those chemicals going into the water. Um, have the more vegetation, the better on the farm in terms of being a barrier between where those pesticides might be coming from and the water source itself. 
Um, Joanne? Yeah, well, I know, I remember seeing um, some research that showed that riparian habitat that intercepts um, polluted water actually gives that, uh, you know, it holds it in the soil long enough that the pesticides start to break down. So um, that, you know, could be a benefit. Um, I'm not sure specifically, though, about neonics. We are hearing that those neonicotoids are um, translocating up into plants, and uh, that's a problem because then if the bird eats some part of the plant, that it's not good. Okay. Um, let's see. We have a question about whether and how many birds are killed by wind farms each year. Um, if placed properly, wind farms can, we can reduce the risk of them being impactful on birds. Unfortunately, um, some of the areas where large wind farms are, um, are also happen to be placed at sites where big migratory pathways were for birds. So I think the more we're going to be depending on, I don't, I don't know, to answer the question, I don't know the, the numbers that are killed each year from that, but it's definitely not as high as something like either window kills or um, cat predators. Um, how, but we're learning a lot more about um, migratory pathways and where to place wind farms so that it's not um, in direct conflict with where birds spend a lot of their time, or bats for that matter. Okay, we have um, someone wondering whether there are similar studies of beneficial birds in and around farms in the Great Plains and typical ag crops there like corn and soybeans and wheat. Um, is that covered in the guide that you posted online or um, is that pretty regional to the West? Yeah, there are some studies in the guide about wheat and uh, uh, Sasha talked about one in corn. I think there's, there's many, many studies that have looked at birds um, in corn uh, fields. And as I recall, most of them are looking at, yes, they're beneficial in the spring before the corn is silking. And then later, they, those same birds may or may not become uh, pests, depending on if they're insectivores or not. And um, sometimes, like, there was a study in the winter where birds were eating uh, crows were eating the um, uh, the pests in corn that the corn wasn't knocked down and there was still some pests there. And then the crows flock in the winter. They took off in the spring before they even had a chance to eat the the later the um, the corn that we would eat. So depends. But yes, look in the, look in our booklet for more. Information. Yeah. The, just, and just to add on that, you know, and a lot of the recommendations that we might give, for example, planting woody hedgerows in, in western landscapes, we might not, we wouldn't actually recommend in areas where prairie lands and grasslands dominate, um, just because a lot of times providing woody habitat in areas where a lot of um, grassland birds are attempting to nest can increase predation. Um, so there is a researcher at Iowa State University I know who's been looking at um, sort of um, using more forb strips for um, soybean crops and even corn to some extent, um, and that those forb strips, which are useful for pollinators, but mostly in her case, they were looking at um, improving habitat for grassland specific birds like western meadowlarks and bobolinks and henslow sparrows. And these are all birds that are having huge declines because of the loss of um, different types of prairies in the Midwest. So there might be different strategies that we would use to try to attract those birds. Um, and could definitely use some more research there. Okay, yeah, maybe that yeah. person could contact us, um, any of us, to yeah. um, see if um, if you need more specific information. Um, they were hoping for a bibliography or some specific studies. So, okay. um, we'll and the guide has a lot of those. Of those. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have. Um, we have a listener from Nepal who's an mm. organic inspector, but he's now in Oklahoma for a few days. And um, he said he watched a film um, when he was traveling from Kathmandu to the United States about the impact of different types of telecommunication frequencies on the bird population and their reproductive capacity. So he was wondering um, whether you know anything about this and whether that's true, if they have a negative impact uh, on birds. Yeah, I, I actually cannot speak to that at all as an avian ecologist. Um, I haven't heard that. And also, welcome to the United States. Um, hope you're having a good trip. Um, yeah, I don't know. Now you've perked my interest, and I'm going to go look that up. It 
I okay. don't know. Yep. Yeah, no, I don't know either. Yeah. Okay, oh, interesting. Um, maybe you can let us know what that film is. <laughs> we can yeah. find out more. <laughs> okay, um, we have a question of what are therodenticides? And, um, okay, yeah, do you know what those are? No. Therodenticides? Okay. Therodenticides, no. Oh, or what? Oh, maybe maybe the maybe they just typed it wrong. Maybe what are the rodenticides? Oh, what are um, the? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <It's> a, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What are the rodenticides that you mentioned? Like, hmm? um, well, there's uh, first generation rodenticides like strychnine, and then there's second generation ones like uh, shoot broadafocin, or I forget the names. But if you just Google second generation. Uh, rodenticides, it, you'll find them. And the second generation are the worst of the two, you know, ideally um, trapping rodents and using uh, birds of prey are, uh, is a much better solution. Um, here, somebody's asking what, uh, okay, and somebody said that e the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, has a rodenticide webpage, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, also, okay, so someone wants to know, you mentioned that, and she noticed, um, she has pastures and can see that grassland birds are declining significantly. Um, do you know some of the species that are declining? I'm sorry, can you say that again? I was yeah, just they thinking of rodenticides. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> yeah, that's a rodenticide. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, they they uh, want to know the names of some of the grassland birds that are declining oh, significantly. Okay. Sure, yeah. Um, um, I can also send a link to a website that talks about this more explicitly, but um, western meadowlarks, which are actually a pretty common species, are declining quite drastically. Henslow sparrows, um, bubble links, um, some of the other um, sparrow species. I'm just bringing up the report right now, but um, there are both that study in science, which um, isn't accessible, but we can get you the link, but also there's a group called Partners in Flight. Um, if you just Google partners in flight and state of the birds, it actually will, um, there's a more re a recent report that's been produced that has detailed species specific information on population trends for all the species that they dealt with. So that'd be a really helpful source. And I'll put it into the message link here. Yeah, put it in the chat box there yeah. and people can um, click on it directly right. there. Um, we have a couple questions coming in about diseases. Oh, I just want to share this comment because this is very interesting. It says another international um, listener here, um, just to share a study done about eight years ago in the Blue Mountains in Jamaica. Um, they found that birds ate more than 50% of coffee berry borers um, than the main insect pest, and it must be in pesticide for coffee. Of course, as an organic farmer, more birds were found on my farm than on most others, which were conventional. I guess Humboldt University and UWI did the study. Yes, um, Matt Johnson's lab um, did the coffee study in Jamaica, and that's where our black-throated blue warbler was um, coming okay. into play. We but have a um, participant here. Yes, yeah, they've done a they've done a ton of work um, um, on those lands. So, or a ton of work on coffee, and yes, birds is greatly reducing the coffee berry borer beetle in those areas. I just we had to choose a select few that covered other crops that weren't covered as much as coffee is. <laughs> Okay, um, so we do have a, question, a couple questions about diseases. We have time for a few more questions here, unless the webinar will cut us off, but I don't think it will. Um, what about um, diseases that birds can bring to your farm? Um, that happened to our farm with our chickens. Wild birds were nesting in the chicken coop and passed mites to the chickens and the chicks creating a problem for them, but we have seen the benefits with birds um, that have been on their farm and they're getting more and more every year. Yeah, so that's an, a really interesting question and something that I feel like research on all ends are kind of moving towards this, which is the more people there are, the less habitat there is, the more we're going to see these interactions between wild species and domestic species and um, animals that haven't been in contact as much are going to be, you know, potentially much more in contact. And so it's definitely something to think about when we're encouraging birds onto farm, which is why a lot of the recommendations are to try to keep the habitat um, that you're or the nest boxes or whatever it is that you're doing to try to bring in beneficial birds, try to keep those separate from your domestic animals to the extent that you can um, to, to try to not encourage those sorts of interactions um, would be 
I know it's a very general recommendation, but um, and there's a lot more research going on in that department too, sort of unexpected transmissions of disease that um, we just didn't know about because these animals weren't in contact as much. And a lot of folks, um, like veterinarians are looking at that. There's the One Health um, Initiative, which is um, looking at some of those issues. Um, so that's a really, really good question. Um, I don't know specifics about mites, um, Joanne, have you run across that? No, no, but that's pretty much what I was thinking too. If you could keep them separate uh, as much as possible, that would be good. Keep the wild separate from the domestic. Yeah, um, okay, so someone else commented that um, since flies and other insects also carry pathogens, it would be interesting to see comprehensive studies addressing the overall pathogen effect of bird presence, something similar to the studies on insect damage. Mm. Yeah, yes, yeah, so you're saying, um, so I was just typing in one of the links to oh, yeah. what okay. I was talking about. Um, so basically, it's asking sort of the cumulative impacts of all the birds as opposed to just um, one particular crop. Was that the question? Um, well, let's see. I'm not exactly sure, okay. but um, I think the person is just interested in the overall pathogen effect of bird presence. Yeah, so... Mm -hmm. um, I would say that that is an unknown, except to say that, uh, you know, I've read, I was actually doing a review for trying to look at the um, effects of potential pathogens in almonds, for example, and, and there's been a ton of research on pathogen spread, and we know for a fact that birds are vectors of some of these pathogens, like Salmonella and E. coli, and certainly that when they, um, their feces will contain those that, um, for a certain amount of time, but, um, we also know that there, or we, there are very, very few studies, like a handful, even less than five, that have been able to link birds acting as a vector, bringing a contamination source into a farm, and that contamination source making people sick. I think there are only maybe three instances. One of them was with cranes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's not um, so that particular exact link has never has not been demonstrated too much. So the understanding is that the risk is very, very low, but it is present. Um, yeah. Right. And then um, uh, salmonella will kill birds. So, you yeah. know, if they don't didn't have some kind of natural uh, way to, you know, stay healthy and um, we wouldn't have birds at all. And, and also there's, um, Many, many different strands of both E. coli and salmonella, some of only a few of which are actually detrimental to humans. So mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of studies that have been done just on regular, you know, spread generalized E. coli or generalized salmonella. And so if you do end up looking into some of that work, just realize also that, that the risk of contracting or having the spread of the, the types of strains that are specifically damaging to people is going to be even much lower than that general transmission rate. There's salmonella and E. coli in everywhere in the environment, actually. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for all the questions, everyone, and yeah, thank, thank you. you for this wealth of information. So thank you so much, Joanne and Sasha, for presenting today, and also thank you to Sarah, who couldn't be here today, and we hope that everyone can join us for future webinars. Um, the next one we have scheduled is going to be on November 14th, and that's going to be on the economics of transitioning to organic grain production, and um, you can find those and all of our webinars on our upcoming and archived webinar page, and you can find all the recordings of all the webinars we've ever done on the eOrganic YouTube channel. So thank you for everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you.